Detection theory refers to the problem of observing some data and deciding whether a target is present or not. And that originated, the terminology anyway, in the early days of the radar community. More generally, this fits within the context of hypothesis testing and has a lot in common with uh, statistics community. So our problem is we observe some data and we want to decide in general if an event occurs. To do this, we'll use a test that we apply to the data. And we're going to introduce some terminology in terms of how we can classify different types of tests. A binary test has two possibilities. So we might have a scenario where a signal of interest is present or a signal of interest is absent. And we would define a hypothesis H0, which consists of the measured data being due to noise alone, whereas hypothesis H1 is the measured data is due to the signal plus noise. And given an observation X, we want to decide which of these two scenarios was in play. So a binary test has two possibilities. An MRI, or a multiple hypothesis test, has more than two possibilities. So we might have a, say, a classification problem where we observe data and there are M possibilities. We've got M different signals plus noise, and we want to decide which of those M signals is in that particular data observation. This comes up in, for example, in wireless communications, where we might send different waveforms to re represent different constellations or patterns of bits. So we can transmit, say, eight bits at a time. But then we have to decide which of two to the eight waveforms were transmitted. And we also need to distinguish between different types of hypotheses. A simple hypothesis, H sub i, corresponds to a scenario where the data corresponding to that hypothesis has a fully known probability density function. For example, if under hypothesis H sub i, x, my observation, is Gaussian distributed with a mean mu sub i and a covariance matrix r, as long as I know mu sub i and r, that is, I fully know the probability density function, then this would be a simple hypothesis. On the other hand, if the PDF of the data is not fully known under that hypothesis, we say the hypothesis is composite. So if I have a case where I'm looking for a known signal in noise, but I don't know the amplitude of the signal or the variance, say, of the noise, then I'd have a composite hypothesis. Because in this case, I've partly specified probability distribution of the signal in that it's Gaussian. I know the mean is A times S, and the covariance matrix is sigma squared I. But since the amplitude of the signal, A, and this variance of the noise, sigma squared, are unknown, I have a composite hypothesis testing problem. So in general, our goal is to observe data X and then have some sort of rule which decides the best hypothesis corresponding to that data. So let's consider the binary case where I have two possible hypotheses, and I'm going to define a region R0 as the set of all x for which I decide that H0 was true, and then we'll have a region R1, which is a set of x for which I decide H1 is true. And if I assume my vector x has two components so I can draw it, then I have a scenario like is shown over here where the red region is a region where R1, so if I observe a particular X and it lands on the red side of this line, I would decide that H1 was true, whereas if it landed on the green side, I would decide that H0 is true. So this is our goal is to somehow partition the space corresponding to the data so that we can make a decision about which category the data came from. Now in general we like to do this so that we obtain good performance. So we need to characterize the performance of such a decision rule. So we're going to again stick with the binary case for simplicity here and in that case there's four possibilities. I'm going to call the first possibility detection and that's the traditional electrical engineering term for this possibility. And that refers to the scenario where H1 is the true hypothesis, 
and we decide that H1 was in force. We can characterize this based on the probability that we decide H1 when H1 is true, and we'll call that probability P sub D, or the probability of detection. In the medical community, this is known as sensitivity, this particular scenario. We say the sensitivity of a particular test, we're referring to the probability that we correctly decide H1. Now, a so-called false alarm occurs when H0 is true, and we decide that H1 was true. And we can define the probability of a false alarm as the probability that we decide H1 when H0 is really true. And in the statistics literature, this is called a type 1 error. These terminology of detection and false alarm have a radar origin in the sense of an incoming enemy aircraft, and we want to either de correctly detect the aircraft, in which case it's really there and we decide it's there, or we have this false alarm because we think that there's an incoming aircraft, but in actuality there's not. The third possibility is that we have what's called a miss. And in this case, H1 is true, but we end up deciding that H0 is true. And we can call this the probability of a miss, which is the probability that we decide H0 when H1 is true. So in my aircraft scenario, in this case, the aircraft really is coming, but we decide there's no none coming, and then we missed it. Statistics community refers to this as a type 2 error. The fourth category, I don't have a conventional electrical engineering origin name for, but that refers to the case when H0 is true, and we decide H0. And the probability when H0 is true that we decide H0 is 1 minus the probability of the false alarm. In other words, it's 1 minus the probability that we decide H1 when H0 is true, because we're going to decide one or the other. And in the medical community, this is known as the specificity of a test. So these are four possibilities, and we can characterize the performance by looking at the probability that we make correct decisions in each of the four cases, and the probability of detection, probably a false alarm, characterize the test. Now, referring, recall we were going to decide that H1 is true when our data X lies in the region R1. So the probability of false alarm is the integral over all X in region R1 of the probability density of X under the condition that H0 is true. Similarly, probability of detection can be expressed as the integral, again, over this region R1 of the probability density of x given that h1 is true. Now the way that these regions r0 and r1 are defined in practice is using a function of the data and a threshold. So we'll identify some function of the data t of x and if the value of that function is greater than some threshold eta we'll say that r1 was true or that the data lied in region r1 and if on the other hand this function of the data is less than R0, is less than eta, we'll decide that R0 is the region in which the data lies. So this leads to a test, T of x, where we decide H1 when this quantity T of x is greater than the threshold, and we decide H0 when it's less than the threshold. Our performance is actually characterized in terms of the properties of T of x. So we're going to let fh0 of t be the probability density function for t of x when h0 is true. And similarly, we'll have fh1 of t be the probability density function of t of x when h1 is true. So I can depict these two probability density functions. I've got the h0 in blue and the h1 in green. And our decision is that we have a threshold eta and if our statistic t is greater than the threshold, we decide h1. If it's less than the threshold, we decide h0. So there's another way in terms of these probability density functions to interpret the probability of false alarm and the probability of detection, the two quantities that tell us how well our test is performing. In particular, the probability a false alarm happens when my data was generated according to the FH0 distribution, in other words, T followed that, but I decided H1, and that happens in the 
pink red shaded region here when I have a value of t that's greater than the threshold eta. So I can write the probability of this event occurring as the area under h0, fh0 from eta to infinity. So the area that's shaded here is a probability of a false alarm. Now the probability of detection, recall that's when h1 is true and I decide h1 is true. So since h1 is true, that means that my test statistic t has this density that's shown in green and I'm going to decide h1 is true when I'm to the right of this threshold eta. So the probability of a correct detection is the area that's shaded in blue here, which can be written as the integral from eta to infinity fh1 of t dt. Now what this kind of diagram does is it shows us that there's an interplay between the probability of a false alarm and the probability of detection. Because as I change this threshold, I'm going to change both of these quantities that characterize the test. In particular, you can see that as the probability of false alarm goes down, which is going to happen when I make move eta to the right, because then there's less area that would be shaded in pink, the probability of detection will also decrease, because then there's less area that will be shaded in blue. And the similar thing happens if we make eta decrease, and you can see that the two quantities are not completely independent. So in order to really characterize the performance of a test, we need to understand how these probably the false alarm and a probability of detection behave together. Because the ideal scenario is that the probability of a false alarm is zero and the probability of detection is one. That would be a perfect test that never made any mistakes. Obviously, if these probability density functions have any overlap, then it's impossible to choose a threshold that will achieve that kind of performance. So to capture this relationship between the probability of detection and the probability of false alarm that's associated with a particular test, we use something called the receiver operating characteristic, which is often abbreviated as ROC. And the ROC describes the trade-off between the probability of false alarm and the probability of detection for a given test T of X. And we typically, that's a graph, will display the probability of false alarm on the horizontal axis and of course, since that's a probability, it's going to range from 0 to 1. And we'll display the probability of detection on the vertical axis. Again, that's going to range from 0 to 1. And I've indicated the medical community terms here as well. This is 1 minus specificity. This is sensitivity. And then we'll have some relationship between the probability of false alarm and the probability of detection. That's a function of the theta threshold eta. So if the threshold is very, very small, or say minus infinity, for example, then I always decide that H1 is true. So I will never make a mistake by missing something. In other words, if H1 is true, I will always decide H1 is true. So I've got perfect detection performance. But if H0 is true, I'm always going to decide H1 is true. So my probability of false alarm is also 1. On the other hand, as I let my threshold get very, very big, that's equivalent to always deciding h0 is true. So in that case, I never make a mistake by saying h1 is true when h0 is true, and consequently my probability of false alarm is zero. But I never decide correctly that there's uh, h1 is true, and consequently my probability of detection is also zero. So these two endpoints govern the performance at the extremes of the threshold, and the behavior in between is going to trace out some characteristic curve, like I've shown in uh, red here. Now the, we know that our performance has to be above what's called the chance line. And the chance line is what happens when I make decisions simply by flipping coins, or some other decision that's independent or ignores the data completely. By looking at where this curve is, I can assess how good of a test that I have. My ideal place that I'd like to operate is in the upper left corner here, or the northwest corner of this diagram, because in this case I'm going to have a very high probability of detection, 
at simultaneously having a very low probability of false alarm. If I could achieve this corner point here exactly, then I would have a perfect test because my probability of detection would be 1 and my probability of false alarm would be 0. Of course, that's not possible in general, as we noted a moment ago. But these ROC curves provide a very convenient way for us to compare different tests sort of independent of the threshold. So if I have one test, T1, given by the whose performance is shown in green, and another test, T2, that's performance is shown in red, clearly T2 is the better test because I can, for a given probability of false alarm, I can always achieve a higher probability of detection. So if I choose that I'm going to operate, say, at some location here for probability of false alarm, my probability of detection for the test T2 is much higher than that for T1. And that's true uniformly throughout this region here. So we'd say that T2 is definitely the better of the two tests. So the ROC is often used to characterize the performance of tests. And we'll look at some examples of particular testing strategies for deciding between our hypotheses in another lecture.